Good morning, TCC. Welcome to our online service. My name is Ryan, and this is Crystal. Hey, everyone, and happy November. We have a few things coming up that we want to make sure that you know about. First of all, next Sunday, November 14th, all Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are due. That's right. Whether you filled one of the cardboard boxes from TCC or you built a box online, November 14th is the deadline for completing and returning all boxes. And don't forget to let us know if you utilize the online options so we can count it towards our goal of 400. For the cardboard boxes, please be sure you fill out the label inside and include the $9 shipping donation for each box before you return it. Also, coming up on November 15th, there's our annual congregational meeting along with the infamous soup and pie dinner. We will be sharing some updates from staff and consistory as well as from our denomination. We will also be selecting our new elders and deacons at that meeting. Mm -hmm. If you are a member of TCC, be sure you have returned your voting cards by next Sunday, November 14. You can mail those to us or drop them off by the office this week. Well, it is the first Sunday of November, which means it's the first week of our new sermon series and more on that later, but it also means that it's almost time for our Thanksgiving outreach. That's right. It's happening on Wednesday, November 24th, and we want you to be a part of this event. 
If you're local, come serve with us. Usually we meet here on the TCC campus, but this year Pipeline Church will be hosting, which means we will be prepping all 5,000 meals in their barn at their campus in Visalia. We'll be there from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., so stop by anytime. But even if you can't be there on November 24th, there are still lots of ways to help. For example, we are looking for a minimum of 50 turkey donations from the TCC community. Yeah, if you're local and want to cook and debone a turkey for the event, you can drop it off at TCC anytime between now and the day of the event. If you're not local or unable to provide a turkey, the best way you can be a part of this event is through prayer. Yes, pray for the event committee as they make preparations for the year's event. Pray for all the volunteers who will show up to prep and deliver meals that day. And mostly pray for all 5,000 people who will receive these warm meals, that they will experience the love of Christ and feel valued and seen wherever they are. Yeah, this is such an important piece. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact the TCC office anytime. We hope to have the chance to serve with you this year. And as is our tradition here at TCC, we will hold our annual Thanksgiving Day in-person service the very next day at 10 a.m. in the sanctuary. All who are able are invited to join us on that special service on November 25th. Well, as you can see, there is a lot going on at and through TCC. And the best way to stay up to date on all of the latest dates and details is through our TCC weekly email sent straight to your inbox every Thursday. Mm -hmm. And if this is your first time tuning in today, first of all, welcome. I know you're probably on information overload right now, but if any of the things we talked about here today sound interesting to you, I hope you'll reach out to us through our connect form online or by contacting our TCC office. We would love to meet you and see how best to get you connected to life and ministry here here at TCC. Well, we have come here today to worship the Lord. It feels like we have officially entered the holiday season, which provides a perfect opportunity to pause and evaluate the posture of our hearts and minds. I know this tends to be the season of busyness along with all the merriment, but let's really do our best to also make it the season of gratitude, praise, and worship. I challenge you to be intentional about this day and to not only come before God with a grateful heart, but with a willingness to pause and be still in His presence. So let's turn it back over to the band on stage. Will you please join us as we worship together? Thanks so much for tuning in today. Take it away, team.
Hey there, TCC. So as our bumper video indicated, we are starting a new sermon series. We wrapped up our series on the book of Jonah last week. I hope that you found it to be edifying. I certainly did. And now we are full-blown entering into the holiday season. We got our decorations up. We are making our preparations for our Thanksgiving outreach. And this series will lead us to our Thanksgiving Day service. And so we were thinking about this, uh, you know, what does this time elicit in us? You know, what issues does it raise? What ideas come to mind during this season? What's the good of it? What's the bad of it? You know, everything has a shadow side to it. And so we want to look at that. And we're calling the series The Vice and the Virtue, right? Dealing with the themes and subjects that are probably on the forefront of our minds during this month. Analyzing them and holding them up to scripture. So the first thing that probably comes to mind when we think about this month is a meal. This entire month centers around a meal. We're probably already thinking about it or making preparations for it. You know, where are we going to celebrate it? Uh, who's going to be with us? Making travel arrangements. Uh, I'm thinking about it. We're moving into our new place around that time. And so, you know, are we going to celebrate Thanksgiving at our place or my mother-in-law's? Uh, don't know. Uh, but to some extent, this meal is going to be on our minds this month in some degree, in some way, shape, or form, we're going to be thinking about it. This month is centered around a meal, and more than a meal, a, a feast, a feast. And when we think about it, when we picture it, you know, every single square inch of our counters or every single square inch of our tables are filled with food. It's excessive. You know, leftovers are guaranteed because there's just way too much food. And we indulge and, and eat too much. It's excessive. It's a feast. It's celebratory, and so it's excessive. And we see this picture in Scripture. Psalm 23, very famous psalm, says this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. That's not moderation. No, it's overflowing. It's excessive. It's overflowing. It's uh, wasteful, even. And so what do we think about that? You know, when it comes down to it, aren't we just uh, stuffing our faces, overindulging, having more food than we could possibly eat uh, while people are starving in the world? Is that Christian? You know, people had the same complaint in the Bible. It says in Mark, while he, that's Jesus, while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. There's a season for everything, as the scriptures say, and Jesus cares about the poor and the downtrodden. He does. And as we enter into this time of feasting and celebrating and excess, we're mindful of that. That's the entire reason behind our Thanksgiving outreach. So we are mindful of that. But Jesus says here, leave her alone. And she's being excessive here, and it's abundant and overflowing, but he says it's a beautiful thing because it's directed to him. Now, our love of God, our devotion to God, our worship of God, and our gratitude to God should not be moderate, should not be stingy or tempered or measured. No, it should be abundant and overflowing. And these are pictures for us and reminders to us. You look at creation, and it will seem excessive. Uh, there's about 2 trillion galaxies. Now put that in perspective. That's about 285 galaxies for every single person on Earth. One light year is 5.88 trillion miles. And the nearest galaxy to ours is 2.5 million light years. You get into those numbers and it really becomes impossible to comprehend. And some people will look at it and they'll say that the universe is so massive that there's got to be life elsewhere in our universe. Carl Sagan famously said, the universe is a pretty big place. If it's just us, 
Seems like an awful waste of space. Now, I think that's a pretty silly quote coming from an atheist because it's implying intentionality. And if there is no creator, then there's no intention behind the size. It's not made to house life. It's not made at all, it just is. And if it's not designed, then it has no purpose. It has no function. So to say that it's a waste makes no sense if it's not designed for utility. But as Christians, we do claim a creator, so we claim purpose and intention and function to our universe. But it's not simply utilitarian. You know, God is an engineer, but he's also an artist. So what's the purpose behind it? Uh, Psalm 19 beautifully captures some of this. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Creation in the universe is excessive. It's joyfully exuberant because it's meant to point us to God, to his power and his majesty and his glory. And his glory is no small thing. His glory is not modest. God's majesty and glory is incomprehensible. It's humbling. It's awe-inspiring. He shows a glimpse of his majesty and his glory by the grandeur of his creation, by the size and scope of our universe in its excess. It's a picture for us, uh, just like it is in Psalm 23. My cup overflows. That's evocative, isn't it? This picture of God lavishing us, pouring out on us his provision, pouring out on us his goodness, pouring out on us his mercy, pouring out on us his grace, and it's overflowing. It's more than we can hold or handle. It's excessive. And likewise, when we feast and we gather together in gratitude to God, the extravagance, the lavishing, the abundance is a picture for us. God's provision, God's goodness to us is no small thing. God's provision and his goodness is not stingy. It's not miserly. No, it's abundant. It's overflowing. It's excessive. And that's what our feasting and celebrating in our meal of thanksgiving ought to point us to. But it needs to be directed to God. You know, there, there's lots of pictures in Scripture of feasting. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a wedding feast, to a wedding banquet. It's celebratory eating. It's more than just a meal, right? It's more than just nourishment. It's more than just hitting the necessary calorie intake to sustain life. And there's something good about that. But even good things can become twisted. In fact, that's all wickedness is. It's spoiled goodness. C.S. Lewis argues in Mere Christianity, he says this, Pleasure, money, power, and safety are all, so far as they go, good things. The badness consists in pursuing them by the wrong method, or in the wrong way, or too much. I do not mean, of course, that the people who do this are not desperately wicked. I do mean that wickedness, when you examine it, turns out to be the pursuit of goodness in the wrong way. You can be good for the mere sake of goodness. You cannot be bad for the mere sake of badness. Feasting can be good, but when it becomes disconnected from God, it becomes something very twisted, where we eat and drink in abundance and excess like we're celebrating, only we're not celebrating anything. And it's not in service to anything. And it's not for anyone except ourselves. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, when our eating and drinking are not in service to the glory of God, it becomes nothing but hedonism, just self-indulgence. And the Bible speaks out forcefully and repeatedly about gluttony. It says in Proverbs, And put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. Those are really strong words. Or how about this? A discerning son heeds instruction, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. It says in Philippians, Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, we live in a culture that is given to excess, that doesn't know how to say when, that is given to gluttony. And we don't like to talk about it. Uh, even in the church, or maybe especially in the church, we don't like to talk about it. It feels mean. It feels unkind. 
Now, there's a natural correlation between overindulging in food and being overweight. And most people, not all, but most people who struggle with their weight already don't feel great about it. And so calling them sinners on top of it feels like uh, kicking them when they're down. You know, I, I addressed this topic on an episode of Appropriating the Culture, which is a weekly teaching series that we put on, on our social media platforms. And in that episode, we, we pointed out that there are contributing factors when it comes to weight. There are. Genetics, physiology, environment can influence it. And so just because you're skinny doesn't mean you're not steeped in the sin of gluttony. And just because you might be currently overweight doesn't mean that you're currently overindulging. So we don't need to be superficially judging one another. That's not the point here. And you may not think that this is your issue or advice that you particularly struggle with. But sin is an issue for all of us. And frankly, I'm willing to bet that gluttony is an issue for you too, at least in spirit. You know, it may not be food precisely or caloric, but I'm willing to bet that there's something in your life that you're overindulging, that is out of balance, that will not be satiated. Maybe it is food. Maybe it is appetite. Maybe it's politics. You know, this past election, I found myself glued to my phone and just, you know, constantly refreshing my Twitter feed because I needed more and more. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's entertainment. After all, aren't we consumers of entertainment? Consuming and consuming, you know, video games can be particularly addictive. Maybe it's social media. Got to get those followers. You know, more and more followers and more and more likes, you know, whatever it takes to get that dopamine rush to the brain. This is a universal problem because wickedness is spoiled goodness and God gives us many, many good gifts. Food is good. It's for our good. And it's not just for survival. It's not just nutrient delivery. No, it tastes good. It smells good. There's pleasure in it. And we gather around it with family and friends. There's fellowship with mirrors. And there's joy in feasting and celebrating with abundance and full plates and overflowing cups. You know, the difference between the vice and the virtue is not external. It's not the thing itself. You know, Jesus says these words, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. The problem is here. The problem of sin is here. There's a film called The Beautiful Mind. Uh, I'm going to give away a spoiler, so sorry if you were planning on seeing it. It's from 2001, though, so... I think the statutes of limitations has run out. But it centers on John Nash, who was a mathematician and a schizophrenic. So he's seeing things that aren't there and seeing people that aren't real. And so here's a scene with his psychiatrist. Let's take a look at this. See them now? Yes. Why did you stop your meds? Because I couldn't do my work. I couldn't help with the baby. I couldn't... I couldn't respond to my wife. I think that's better than being crazy. We'll need to start you on a higher run of insulin shocks and a new medication. No. There has to be another way. Schizophrenia is degenerative. Some days may be symptom-free, but over time, you're getting worse. It's a problem. That's all it is. It's a problem with no solution. And that's what I do. I solve problems. That's what I do this best. This isn't math. You can't come up with a formula to change the way you experience the world. All I have to do is apply my mind. There's no theorem, no proof. You can't reason your way out of this. Why not? Why can't I? Because your mind is where the problem is in the first place. I can do this. I can work it out. All I need is time. Is that the baby? Babies at my mother's, John.
That's a problem, isn't it? He can't rely on himself. He can't trust himself. He can't look inwardly to solve this problem because that's where the problem lies. If we don't recognize the source of the problem, then we'll never find the solution. If we're just looking inwardly, if we're just looking to ourselves, if we're thinking of this in just physical terms where we're just going to work harder. You know, I know I have a problem with food. I know I have a problem with drinking. I know I have a problem with addiction. I know I have a problem with sin, but I'm just going to get a handle on it. You know, I'm just going to fix myself. But you can't fix yourself because that's where the problem is. You know, I, I love a song by the Avett brothers called Ill With Want. It goes like this. I am sick with wanting, and it's evil how it's got me. And every day it's worse than the one before. The more I have, the more I think I'm almost where I need to be. If only I could get a little more. Something has me. Oh, something has me. Acting like someone I don't want to be. You know, we want to live virtuous lives, but we feel that bondage, don't we? You know, I'm trying and I'm trying. I'm trying to eat right. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to live a virtuous life. I'm trying and I'm trying and I just can't seem to change. The Apostle Paul writes these words in Romans. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, oh, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Oh, something has me. Something has me. Acting like someone I don't want to be. We can't look inwardly. We can't solve it ourselves because that's where the problem lies. We have to look beyond ourselves. We have to look to something that is transcendent. In the film, uh, Nash can't trust himself. He can't rely on himself. He can't trust his senses. And so he looks beyond himself and latches on to logic. He latches on to a transcendent source for truth. L logic is immaterial. It's not physical. It doesn't reside in the brain. It is beyond ourselves. It is transcendent because it's from God. But as Christians, uh, we, just, we don't just know uh, logic, we know the author of logic. And so how much more so will we find truth and transformation when we latch on to him? If we want to live virtuous lives, if we want to live a transformed life, we'll never get that by looking inwardly or staring at ourselves in the mirror. See, if we're just staring at ourselves in the mirror, we might see our flaws, we might see our shame, but we'll never see him. And he's who we need. You know, it says in 2 Corinthians, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And that's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly. One is looking to ourselves and one is looking to Christ. The Apostle Paul, after lamenting that he does the things he doesn't want to do, he concludes this way, What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, he rescues us from death. He frees us from our bondage. He transcends our sin nature and saves us from ourselves. The problem is here. And so this is the promise that he gives us. Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It declares in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Jesus solves the problem. He makes us new creations and gives us new hearts, transforms us from the inside so that we can live lives of virtue by looking to Jesus and following him. Virtuous lives, but also abundant lives. Life to the fullest, that's what he promises us. He takes away our sin, he takes away our gluttony, and he offers us his body as bread and his blood as wine, and we taste and see that the Lord is good, and when nothing would satiate, God satisfies. Full plates, cups overflowing, a feast in a banquet hall. But a virtuous life is not just filled with feasting. It's not Thanksgiving every day. And there's time for fasting. In Jesus' question about this in Mark, it says this, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. As some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day they will fast. The abundant life is not free from fasting. It's not free from mourning. It's not free from grief. And we see that in our church family. Uh, people who are in grief, who are in mourning. Uh, people who uh, may not have much of an appetite this Thanksgiving. But a virtuous life and an abundant life comes from being transformed to be like Jesus. And God does that through the times of feasting and the times of fasting. And Jesus asks his disciples a question. He says, can you drink the cup I drink? And James and John reply, yeah, we, we can. And Jesus says, you will. But they don't know what they're asking uh, because the cup that he's talking about is a cup of suffering. And we're called as disciples of Jesus to suffer like Christ, to suffer for Christ, to carry our cross and follow him. But the cup we drink isn't quite the cup that Christ drank. You know, one commentary put it this way, that the cup we drink is not of the self-same, but of what was like unto it, meaning that they should endure much persecution for his name's sake, as all that will live godly in Christ Jesus must expect in one way, shape, or another. Ours is a cup of suffering, but it's not a cup of wrath. Because Jesus took that cup. Jesus took a cup overflowing with our sin, overflowing in God's righteous judgment, overflowing in God's wrath, so that our cups, even in suffering, are filled with God's grace, are brimming with God's goodness, are overflowing with his mercy and abundant in his love, so that we can come to any table, maybe with heavy hearts, but also and always with gratitude. Let's turn our hearts to praise him.
Friends, let's live righteous lives, transformed by Christ into new creations and guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, hear these words from Peter as our benediction. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Go in peace.